Hi, welcome. Thanks for joining us. My name is James Hargrove. I'm here with my colleague Betsy Popkin, and we're going to talk a little bit about business and human rights. So, uh, Betsy, everyone knows about business. Everyone knows a bit about human rights. Um, but what is business and human rights? How do they interact? How do they intersect? What does that mean? So the easiest way to describe business and human rights is the intersection between a company's business activities, its impact on human rights, and the soft and hard law obligations that that company has. In 2011, uh, the UN Human Rights Council endorsed the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. And what that did for companies is it obligated them to respect human rights which means that they should mitigate their human rights impacts of their business activities. What that means in practice is that companies have human rights policies, conduct due diligence on human rights issues that they face in their business practices, and try to remediate for any human rights harms that their business activities uh, create. Um, of course, this is a soft law document, but a lot of companies have signed on to the, biz the UN Guiding Principles voluntarily. Um, and in addition, we're seeing an increase in human rights regulations in jur jurisdictions worldwide. Um, we can see this with human trafficking and modern slavery is on the uptick. There are increased conversations in jurisdictions around the world on um, AI and human rights issues or content moderation on social media platforms and human rights issues. Um, and we can see it in conflict minerals, child labor, um, just to name a few. And I'm happy to go into a few examples later. Sure. So the human rights, uh, the guiding principles sound like the, uh, the most important international uh, treaty convention, right? Um, uh, is everything else purely national? Are there any other international instruments or treaties? Yeah, so um, one of the questions I often get is, well, what are human rights? And what are the human rights that apply to companies? Um, and when we look at human rights, we look at international legal instruments like the Universal Declaration on Human Rights and like the International Labor Organization um, eight core conventions or the ICCPR. Um, and we look to those documents for what are human rights obligations. Um, just an example of some of the human rights obligations that companies face often um, are right to privacy issues, freedom of expression issues, uh, labor issues. Some companies even face right to life and freedom from torture issues, particularly if they're operating in countries that are either conflict zones and or authoritarian governments operate there. Um, so there are a range of issues that companies deal with, um, but they all stem primarily from these international human rights law documents. Right. And just to be clear, these, 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 these documents and these treaties and these conventions, they're not binding, there aren't sanctions for not complying with them, but they're voluntary, are they? Yeah, I mean, so they are soft law documents. Um, these conventions and like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights has become essentially common law um, because it's been universally recognized um, by countries and individuals around the world um, as being binding. That said, they're only so good as they can be enforced. And so that's when countries um, and local jurisdictions need to step in to actually create laws that enforce and bind um, both governments as well as companies. Um, and that's where we're seeing kind of an uptick in how different um, countries are addressing particular human rights issues. Right. So tell me, why do companies, why do they care about these issues? What, what, what motivates a business to be involved with compliance with some non-binding uh, UN principles, like the guiding principles. Um, what motivates them? Why is it important to their um, commercial life, to their financial interests? Uh, is, it a, is it a moral issue, or is it all of those things? Yeah. 
I mean, so some people just want to do what they see as being the right thing. Um, but there are a wide range of uh, reasons why companies decide to voluntarily bind themselves, for instance, to the UN Guiding Principles. And um, those tend to be there is more pressure now on companies from investors and shareholders um, and the public at large in kind of media and the way that media portrays human rights abuses that companies cause. You also see an increase in uh, employees at companies really caring about these issues, both in terms of how it impacts them in their workplace, um, when you're looking at kind of more labor-related issues, um, but also in terms of the impact that their company is having globally around the world outside of the workplace on individual human rights. Um, and then, of course, going back to the laws and regulations, there are hard laws that companies need to abide by to ensure that they're not, um, you know, stepping into hot water um, in terms of their compliance. What areas do you see uh, which are emerging now? Where's, where's the frontier? Where, where, are the, where are the hot topics now and where are the issues that are going to arise in the future that we should be thinking about now? So the AI and human rights area is an area that's rapidly developing. In the Bay Area and Silicon Valley, many companies now have AI ethics professionals devoted to focusing on how those companies build out their AI products in ways that are consistent with human rights norms and pay attention to who those products are being sold to and who the users are um, in a way that won't impact human rights. Um, so, you know, AI, human rights, what are the potential impacts AI can have on human rights? Um, one of the areas that's often pointed to is discrimination. Um, and again, this has to do with kind of the inputs that go into the AI algorithm. If those are biased inputs, that could lead to biased outcomes. One area that's often raised is, for instance, a fintech company. Um, if you have biased inputs going into the algorithm deciding who, for instance, gets loans or uh, gets credit, then, uh, then you're going to have biased outputs in terms of who is eligible for those loans or credit. Another area, uh, human rights area, that we see with AI is in the area of privacy. And I, I mentioned this a bit earlier, but if, for instance, a company develops AI surveillance technology, who does that company sell it to? And what are they responsible for in terms of how that user uses it. So if a company sells it to an authoritarian government that uses it to spy on its civilian population, that impacts that population's right to privacy, which can then also impact uh, their right to freedom of assembly and sometimes even you know, violations of um, their right to life and freedom from torture. Um, so that's another key area. And we also see AI play into human rights in terms of freedom of expression issues. I mentioned earlier um, how social media platforms use AI now for their content moderation. Um, and depending on how those algorithms are developed, they could be developed in a way that allows you know, too much product on the platform in line with the um, their content policy, or it could be too broad or too strict and cut out um, certain posts, and that would violate the user's freedom of expression and opinion. Um, so those are some areas, um, and we're seeing more and more discussions now taking place in capitals around the world on how to regulate. AI to ensure that human rights and ethics norms are taken into consideration. Um, so that's an area to really look out for. Right. What about um, uh, another one that you hear a lot about is the gig economy? Yep. So the California legislature just passed a new law, um, which essentially makes gig workers employees for the purposes of receiving employee benefits. Before that happened, um, companies that rely upon gig workers were thinking about ways to protect those workers' human rights in light of the laws not catching up. So short of a law that makes them employees, how could the companies 
protect their rights. So looking at things like um, a fair wage, the right to assembly, the right to leisure, um, and being able to you know, work kind of a reasonable set of hours. Um, so companies were looking at ways to give gig workers these protections short of making them employees. Um, and different jurisdictions around the world are now dealing with this in different ways through different laws to try to ensure that the human rights of these gig workers are protected in light of this new model of work. And where, where that's going to end up is really interesting, of course, because there's a policy question uh, how far human rights legislation should go that, yeah. that clients need to, need to stay up to date with and, and, uh, and need to monitor and help uh, and try to predict because, for example, there's pushback from those workers in relation to these sorts of legislation, right? Right. right. It's not clear where the policy is right. going to end up. I think. So we've talked a bit about what business and human rights is, how it, how it locks in hard and soft law obligations, um, what, what themes there are and what human rights are involved. What would you say in-house counsel should be thinking about in terms of addressing these issues? What concrete things can they do? What should they be considering and what should they be talking with their external advisors about? If in-house counsel does not yet have buy-in, that's kind of a preliminary issue that they would want to do in terms of going to the GC, the board, whoever is necessary to give kind of top-down buy-in into the human rights issues. If I were in-house counsel, this is how I would start. I would start by figuring out what are all of the human rights issues that my company faces. And you do that by talking to people in each of the different business streams within the company. Um, this is called identifying your salient human rights issues. Um, oftentimes in shorthand, uh, business and human rights lawyers will say, conduct an initial human rights impact assessment. So that's step one, is figure that out. Um, step two would be revisiting your company policies um, to ensure that they address all of the salient human rights issues that you identified. It is now the trend to draft new standalone human rights policies, um, but what companies can also do is take a look at their existing ones, see if it covers all of their salient human rights issues, um, if there are just a few that need to be plugged in, plug those into the existing ones or create supplemental ones. Um, so that's number two. And then the third thing would be um, taking a look at the processes within the company. So the existing due diligence and compliance processes and ensuring that those salient human rights issues are addressed in those processes. So you're monitoring how the company is or is not impacting. Um, those human rights and able to report out on it. Um, so those would be the three things that I would do um, if I were in-house counsel uh, newly coming to this issue of human rights. And, and all the way through, there's a theme there, I think, of internal stakeholder engagement for in-house counsel. These are really issues that go to all levels of the company, from those that are writing uh, code for AI-related um, um, processes and up to the border level. Right. Uh, C-level issues for matters of image and systemic importance for companies, I think. Right. The interesting thing about business and human rights is it's an area of the law that includes and incorporates people in all places of the companies, you know, up at the top with like the board and the CEO to the products people and the engineers and the operations team and the lawyers and the policy folks. Everyone needs to be up to speed on kind of what, what it is, what their part is um, to mitigate the company's impact on human rights. Mm -hmm.